Fish fam, it is time to start the next Slayer Fest reading vlog. Hopefully, if I did my job correctly, I was able to get some B-roll footage of my day yesterday. Also, if it's very loud in the background, that is because I'm in my open common area. That's where kind of my desk is set up. And I currently have my dryer going as well as my countertop composter, which can get very loud as it's nearing its end stages of composting. So I apologize if it's super loud. Anyway, when I ended the last vlog, I wasn't really sure what I was going to pick up yet. I had just finished The School for Good Mothers by Jessamyn Chan, and I was kind of in a weird space. I wanted something that was more of a palette cleanser, but yet the books on my TBR that I would consider more of a palette cleanser, like the two K.A. Tucker books that I have to read, I didn't feel like I was in the mood to jump into those yet. So I randomly decided to pick up The Last Invitation by Darby Kane. The reason I picked this one up, even though it's not on my May TBR at all, is because it will actually satisfy the Riley prompt for Slayer Fest to read one of the lowest rated books on my TBR. And The Last Invitation, sadly, was the lowest rated book. And I say sadly because I have read Darby Kane's two other books, and I really enjoyed both of them. There is just something so compelling about Darby Kane's writing and I just really enjoy what I read from her. This book was no different in the fact that it was compelling and compulsively readable, but I felt like this didn't have as much structure and substance as the other two did. There is a theme that kind of runs through Darby Kane's books in that she typically writes about strong women dealing with bad men in some way, and it's kind of similar in this story as well. So in this story you're following two main characters, you're following Jessa and you're following Gabby, and there's also a third perspective in here it's kind of just a generalized perspective coming from the foundation and the foundation is essentially a group of women that takes vengeance on bad men it's basically people who did not find justice within the law or they can't find justice within the law and so they take that into their own hands my complaint about the last invitation is that the foundation which is what they call their group was very abstract very gray darby kane did not go into a lot of detail about the foundation who was involved what they did she just gave you a very basic overview of what their whole mission was and just a couple of people who were involved but that's it so it didn't really feel flushed out and fully realized for me so i didn't feel connected overall to that group or their mission i wasn't invested in it so you're following these two women and then how they ultimately end up intersecting and trying to help each other and things like that so again it was a very compelling read it was a very interesting read i was interested from start to finish in the story but it kind of was lackluster overall it was very anticlimactic i really didn't feel very thrilled or anything it didn't really catch me up guard in any way. There was nothing super unique about the concept of this story. So this is definitely my least favorite of Darby Kane's novels. Fell flat for me. I'm debating on a 3 or a 3.5. I'm not entirely sure right now. I might sleep on it and kind of wait to figure out how I really feel about it because it didn't live up to my expectations. Do I think it deserves to be the lowest rated book on my TBR? Probably not, but it didn't quite meet my expectations. Next, I've decided to go ahead and read The Raven King by Maggie Stiefvater. This is the fourth and final book in the Raven Boy cycle. I plan on reading this for the Slayer Fest prompt of the trio to read a book that features a found family or strong friendship group and this series definitely does. It's a series that I really want to get done and completed because I've lost a lot of momentum on it. This is a young adult magical realism story and I remember reading the first one and being really captivated by it but I feel like the other books are just kind of getting a little bit more abstract, a little bit weirder and that doesn't always necessarily work for me and I want to go ahead and just get it done, get it out of the way. It will satisfy a Slayer Fest prompt. It will complete a series for me so I'm happy to just be starting it and getting it done and hopefully I can knock it out really really quick and then I'll see what I move on into next but we're definitely making progress and plugging away. Today has just really been a filming day. It's been a chore day, an editing day and now I'm about to go take a bath and relax for a little bit before I finish up the laundry and cleaning the kitchen after dinner and doing more productive things. I definitely need to edit and stuff like that so we're gonna get on it but I never formally opened this vlog and I didn't film anything else today for the vlog so I just wanted to come on here and pop in and say hi and I will check in with you when I have more of an update on The Raven King, although I can't necessarily tell you much about it because it's the fourth and final book. But once I have more thoughts, I will let you know. friends. It is Tuesday morning. This is the last day that I will be going into work late to compensate for the fact that our dog sitter can't come during the middle of the day to let them out. And since I'm here, once again, I wanted to go ahead and do an update. I don't really have much of a reading update because I am still in the middle of The Raven King by Maggie Stiefvater. I was hoping to have it finished by yesterday, but that was like a really ambitious dream because I still have about three hours of listening time left for that book. I didn't listen to it yesterday as long as I was hoping to, but even if I had, I still wouldn't have been able to finish it. So I have to finish it today for sure. I don't have a 
a reading update. However, yesterday I did come home to an exciting package. It was April's adult book only adult fairy loot. So I wanted to go ahead and unbox it here. I have opened the package, but I haven't like unboxed it. So I don't know what the book is. So let's see. Okay. So the theme is strings attached. I don't want to look at the spoilers. I'm going to pull up the bag. Ooh, are those purple sprayed edges? I'm intrigued already. Okay. Ooh. All right. Let's see what we've got. Oh, in the lives of puppets by TJ Clune. This is flipping stunning. Oh, look at those sprayed edges y'all. But I'm going to be honest. I don't think I'm going to be reading this book. I just really don't have any interest in TJ Clune. I have heard amazing things about the house in the Cerulean Sea, and I don't doubt that it's a wonderful story. It's just not really something I'm interested in. It's not really up my alley. And I did try Under the Whispering Door, just couldn't get into it. And I don't think TJ Clune's whimsical stories and writing is for me. So even though this book is flipping beautiful, oh my gosh, like it is stunning. It is really, really tempting me to continue. But I mean, I've heard the synopsis of this one, and it just doesn't even seem like something I'm interested in. Let me read it to you, okay? Look at those end pages. Holy cow, why does this book have to be so beautiful? In a small home built into the branches of a tree live a human named Victor and three robots. These are a pleasantly sadistic nurse machine, a small vacuum desperate for love and attention, and a fatherly inventor android named Giovanni Lawson. Together they are a family hidden and safe. Then Vic salvages an unfamiliar android labeled Hap. He learns that Hap and Geo share a dark past where they hunted humans, and Hap unwittingly gives away Geo's location. Before they know it, robots from Geo's former life arrive to capture and return the android to his old laboratory in the city of electric dreams. The rest of the unconventional family must travel across the unforgiving and otherworldly country to rescue Geo from decommissioning, or worse, reprogramming. Along the way, Vic must decide if he can handle his feelings for Hap, even if they come with strings attached. I believe that this is supposed to be a Pinocchio retelling, and that just, just doesn't interest me, but it is stunning even on the naked hardcover. Y'all, it is so beautiful. It's probably one of like the most beautiful books I've ever seen. I think I'm just gonna have to sell it on Pingo. I don't wanna force myself to read a book I'm really not interested in just because it's beautiful. Well, that was a bummer, but at least it's a book that I don't have to add onto my TBR because I'm already behind. This is, I think, the third adult fairy loot box that I've gotten and I haven't read any of the books yet because I've been slowly slogging my way through Way of Kings and these are definitely books that I want to read like physically with my eyeballs. So I'm planning on getting on the wagon and reading more of these picks like as soon as I'm done with Way of Kings and some other fantasy reads but this is just not one that's going to get added to my TBR. All right y'all I've got to finish getting ready for work. That is just the update I wanted to share that bookish mail. Like I said a stunning stunning book but I'm not gonna read it. I will check in with you when I have another reading update possibly when I finish The Raven King. I just don't know if I'm gonna have much to say about it because it is the fourth and final book in a series. I will come back on to let you know when I finished it, my overall thoughts and what I plan on reading next. So I'll talk to you then. Hi friends, it is Wednesday morning and I just wanted to come on here and give you a reading update because I actually have one at the moment. I did end up finishing The Raven King by Maggie Steve Otter last night, the fourth and final book in the Raven Boys cycle. And it was fine. I honestly, every time I finish one of those books, I'm never quite sure what I've read. If you're not familiar, The Raven Boys is a young adult quartet series and it follows our main character, Blue Sergeant. And she is a girl that grew up in a family and a home of psychics. She doesn't have psychic powers of her own, but she's kind of like an amplifier for their powers. She ends up connecting with Gansey and a couple of other boys from Aglianby, which is like this really elite private school. And Gansey's on the hunt for Glendower, who is supposedly this Welsh king, this old Welsh king, who is sleeping on a ley line, which is like a magical energy line that's running through all of where they are. Blue goes on this quest with Gansey and his friends to find Glendower. And there's also other things going on with his friends. Like one of his friends, Ronan, is a dreamer and he can actually go and take things from his dreams. So there's a lot of magical realism stuff going on and I find a lot of the times that these books are very metaphorical. I don't want to say flowery because I don't think that's the right word. I don't think Maggie Steve Otter's prose is flowery but a lot of the time it is very metaphorical, oftentimes abstract and I have a hard time grasping that, holding on to it and being able to like picture it in my mind. So a lot of the time when I'm reading The Raven Boys it just filters through like nothing sticks within my mind. So I get done reading the story and I'm like what on earth just happened? What the heck did I just read? I do really enjoy Blue and Gansey and Ronan and Adam and all of the characters in this story. That was not the issue for me. It was just the overall like plot and the storytelling. It was a little bit too whimsical, a little bit too far out there for me to truly connect to it and enjoy it. It just went over my head in a lot of ways. And I kind of felt like the ending was was somewhat anticlimactic. So it wasn't my favorite, but I knew I needed to go ahead and just get it done and out of the way because I had lost so much momentum with this series. I wasn't even sure if I was going to continue, but I only had one book left and I was like, you know what? We're going to do it. We're going to finish this. We're going to move on. We're never going to have to think about it again. I have since started One Tiny Lie by K.A. Tucker. This is one of the books that I pulled as a challenge prompt from my little jar that I pull from every single month. It is the second book in her 10 Tiny Breaths series. I believe it's a quartet of books, so this is two out of four. And so far it's okay. After I finish this one, depending on how it goes, I'm not entirely sure I'm going to continue with this series. I'm not fully invested in it or anything. I just love K.A. Tucker so much and I want to read everything that she's written. But this series is definitely older. I think it's about 10 years old at this point. 
point and I'm already about I want to say probably like 35 to 40 percent of the way into the story that I'm currently reading and it's an easy read it's a palette cleanser which I really feel is like what I need right now after some of the books that I've been reading but I don't think it's going to be anything substantial that I love this story is following Libby who is the sister of the main character that we followed in book one and in book one you're meeting Casey and the aftermath of a very tragic drunk driving accident that took the lives of her parents she wasn't the one driving somebody else hit them in their car she was in the car along with her boyfriend their parents and I think Libby might have been in the car too Libby was fine Casey was brutally hurt so she spent so much time in hospitals and physical therapy and she just had such a hard time dealing like she was using sex drugs alcohol to kind of numb the pain numb the feeling they're sent to live with their uncle and aunt and it wasn't a great situation and so Casey is determined to get Libby out of there so she kind of takes her and moves to Miami and it's following their journey as they're just trying to survive without their parents on their own they're very young Casey in the first book I think is maybe like 18 or 19 and Libby is only 15 and in this story she is now 18 and she's going off to Princeton so she's on her own for the first time and she's very young very naive she's always been the very responsible logical one and so she's getting to college and she's experiencing all of these things for the very first time Casey and their psychiatrist really want Libby to like bust out of her shell they want her to kind of be wild for a little while because she's always just been so I don't necessarily know for press is the right word but she's always been the good girl always following the rules she's never been drunk she's never been kissed she's never done any of that and so they kind of want her to break out of her shell and her first night at college they end up at a college party and some like wild things go down and she's kind of dealing with the aftermath of that where she meets a boy and he's kind of the player on campus and she ends up kissing him that night and there's some ramifications to that and now she's meeting that boy's best friend who she really likes so it definitely sounds like there's going to be a love triangle in here which you know I don't necessarily love does anybody really love it you can already tell that the player is going to be the object of her affection even though there's this perfectly charming Irish boy that really likes her so I, don't, I already don't like the direction that this is headed but you know we're gonna see how it plays out I'm sure that there's more to player boy than meets the eye so far this is just kind of like very basic I'm just gonna ride the wave of this one but it will be another book from my May TBR done and that is what I'm looking for all right y'all I definitely need to go ahead and head into work because I am late at this point but I wanted to give you an update I will check in with you when I have more updates or when there's something else going on Hello friends, it is Saturday morning and I wanted to go ahead and pop on here because I do have some reading updates for you and also just kind of a weekend update. I am currently on the way to work commencement. It is the spring graduation ceremony for my university and so I will be there basically all day. I have to be there from seven to around four or five-ish. So there's not gonna be a whole heck of a lot of content today or possibly even tomorrow because Sunday is always a big chore day but I also have to help Robert get ready for a week-long work trip that he's taking. So it is just busy, busy, busy this week weekend but I realized that I hadn't really done much updating the past couple of days. I think the last update I gave you was that I had decided not to finish One Tiny Lie by K.A. Tucker and instead picked up Georgie All Along by Kate Claiborne which I have since finished and I have now started Stay Awake by Megan Golden. Hello friends, editing Brittany here coming to you as a hot mess as per usual as you've come to expect from me. I was editing my vlog and I realized that I am missing a clip and I think I've already deleted it from my phone. It is the one where I transitioned from reading One Tiny Lie to Georgie All Along by Kate Claiborne. So I actually decided to DNF One Tiny Lie by K.A. Tucker because I didn't like the direction that it was headed. And it actually kind of killed me to DNF that story because I really love K.A. Tucker. I think she's solidly one of my favorite contemporary romance authors of all time. And for the most part, I've really enjoyed enjoyed everything that I've read by her. But this was one of her older series and I just wasn't vibing with the story overall. So I think in my last update I told you that Livy is trying to break out of her shell and her very first night in college she goes to a college party she gets drunk she ends up making out with one of the most popular
popular guys on campus, so on and so forth. And now she's being introduced to this wonderful, charming boy who ends up being Ashton, popular guy's best friend. She doesn't know this at first. She doesn't know this until she's going to a party that he invited her to. And then she realizes that he is Ashton's best friend and they are both trying to keep it secret from him. What happened that night? They don't really want to ruin anything. They don't want to make it complicated. But also at this time, she realizes that Ashton actually has a girlfriend. So not only is he a player, but he's actually an unfaithful player because he's got a girlfriend who is in college in Seattle. So it's a very long distance relationship and he is not being faithful to her whatsoever. And Livy witnesses this firsthand. She witnesses this behavior, but yet she obviously cannot stop thinking about him. And even though she's got this really sweet cinnamon roll of a boy who really likes her and is invested in her, she can't stop thinking about Ashton. And that's where it kind of lost me because he has fully shown his character, but yet you can't stop thinking about him. And it gets even worse when he sits next to her in class and like hands her a note about how much like he can't stop thinking about her. And the only thing he regrets about that night is the fact that it didn't continue. And I was just like vomit in my mouth a little bit. I obviously don't know how the story ended. It could be that maybe she doesn't end up with Ashton. You know, maybe it's not as predictable as I'm thinking it is. But what I think ends up happening is Ashton is maybe going to get some kind of redemption arc. Maybe he's not as terrible as we all think. And I just really couldn't stomach that. That's not what I wanted to see. I think he would have to do a lot in order to redeem himself after the behavior that you witnessed within those first couple of chapters. And I just wasn't vibing with it. And I definitely didn't want to see a love triangle happen because right at the bat, you know that the player guy, that Ashton is going to be the center of attention. And that poor little charming Irish boy, I cannot remember his name, is going to get the shaft. So it's in no way, shape or form going to be an even love triangle. And I just did not have the patience for it. It wasn't what I was looking for. I wasn't enjoying it all that much. I wasn't connecting to the story. So I stopped reading it and instead decided to pick up Georgie all along by Kate Claiborne because this actually came in from a hold from my library. So I wanted to just take a quick second to talk about Georgie all along and stay awake. Georgie all along, I found to be a very cute contemporary romance. Basically it follows Georgie who has unexpectedly lost her job as a personal assistant to a big time celebrity actress in LA because that actress kind of wants to change her life, reinvent her life. And so Georgie is now unemployed. She's heading back to her hometown because her best friend has recently moved back as well. She's having a baby. She's settling down. She's just bought a new house and Georgie thinks it's the perfect time to kind of go back and help her out with that. Georgie herself is very lost. She's not sure where she's going or what she's doing next. She's always just kind of lived in the moment with no long-term plans and she's always very much kind of been one to focus on others and not herself. And she's expecting to go and live at her parents' home and for the moment her parents are out traveling in an RV and so she's going to have the house to herself. But what her parents neglect to tell her or what they forgot about actually was that they had told Levi, who is a friend of theirs and who had done some work for them, that he could stay at their house while his place is being renovated. So Georgie receives a huge shock one night when she is home alone and all of a sudden Levi walks in. Levi actually happens to be the older brother of a boy she went to high school with, somebody she had a massive crush on, but also Levi has not a great reputation in the town. He was known as a troublemaker for a lot of his youth. He has since really cleaned himself up. He's a really good guy, really hardworking guy. He keeps to himself. He keeps his nose clean. It's just him and his dog. And he just wants to like stay out of everybody's way because a lot of the town does not have a great opinion of him. And he definitely has a lot of baggage because he doesn't see or speak to his family. They got into a huge blowout when he was in his early 20s. And I want to say it's been like 13 or 14 years since this event, but he hasn't really seen or spoken to them. And it can make things difficult because his family is pretty prominent in the town and they own this kind of like hotel resort place with a restaurant and a spa. And Georgie actually gets a position helping out there. She used to waitress and they needed a waitress desperately. And so she went there to help. And so as she and Levi are getting to know each other, there's this big gaping chasm in their relationship because she can't really talk to him about her work because it involves his family. So you're watching these things develop. You're watching the complications that are coming in their relationship. You're watching Levi deal with his own baggage and Georgie try to figure herself out. And overall, it was just a really sweet, heartwarming time. I really did like the depiction of Georgie's character. She really wasn't a manic pixie dream girl, which I appreciated. There was just something solid and strong about her character. She just filled up every space. She loves people. She genuinely cares about people. She cares about Levi. She sees more in Levi. So overall, a pretty positive reading experience. I finished this yesterday in the afternoon and I'm still like thinking about it now and then. I really enjoy the characters. I would definitely read more from Kate Claiborne in the future. And then, like I said, now I'm starting Stay Awake by Megan Golden. And this is a mystery thriller that is following our main character, Libby. And basically every time she falls asleep, she wakes up and she doesn't remember things. And at this point in the story, I'm still very early days. We don't know anything about why that is. All that we know as readers so far is that she has fallen asleep and woken up twice. And each time she has completely forgotten. And all she knows is that on her hands are the words stay awake and wake up. And she's really just trying to piece together everything that is happening because she does not remember. And she doesn't remember the past two years she finds out. So she's basically two years in the future. She doesn't remember anything that has happened. And so it's a mystery and we're just kind of going on this ride with her. And the second perspective we are following is a Detective Halliday. There has been a murder and she is trying to solve it. And on the window in the murdered guy's apartment is the words wake up. And so obviously the two timelines are going to connect. We're going to find out 
what the heck is going on with Liv, why she keeps forgetting everything every time she goes to sleep, what she has to do with the murdered man, and color me intrigued. I am really enjoying this story so far. I have read two other Megan Goldens and I've enjoyed those as well. And I think that this is just going to take me on a pretty enjoyable ride. So I'm here for it. But anyway, y'all, that sun is getting bright and I have to head to the Coliseum where the graduation is taking place. I've got a little coffee with me. I'm just gonna drink it and enjoy the morning before the chaos starts. So I will check in with you as soon as I can, as soon as I have another reading update. But for now, I'll talk to you later. It is Monday at around 11 o'clock. I'm about to head to lunch, but I wanted to go ahead and give you an update because it's actually been a really long time since I've updated you. I think the very last update I gave was Saturday morning when I was headed to work commencement. So kind of as expected, I wasn't really able to do anything else on Saturday. I worked commencement from seven to around four. And then by the time I got home, I was literally just doing chores and editing all the rest of the afternoon. I was so tired by like nine o'clock that I was just, I was falling asleep standing up. I was barely able to keep my eyes open and I just had to go to sleep. But from the time I got home to the time I went to sleep, I was cleaning and just trying to get things ready. My house was a disaster. And so I was working on that. I had so much laundry to do. And Sunday was a normal Sunday, except for the fact that I wasn't able to finish editing the video that I needed to go up on Sunday. So I spent part of the morning doing that and getting that up. And then I had to film two more videos on top of the laundry and the cooking and the cleaning and all of the other stuff that I had to do. So Sunday was very, very busy. Anyway, I do have a reading update for you. I have finished Stay Awake by Megan Golden. And I really, really enjoyed this story, y'all. It is a solid four stars. Not only was it incredibly engaging, it was one that kept me wanting to turn the page. I absolutely wanted to know what happened. I felt like it was overall a very unique concept. It used the idea of dissociative fugue states to kind of describe the condition that our main character Liv was suffering with her memory loss and how it is probably actually a real thing. I mean, I'm not sure I'm not a medical expert, but it sounded like it was a real thing. What I really found fascinating about this was that you are getting the two perspectives. You are getting Liv and then you are getting Detective Halliday's. But with Liv's, you are not learning about Liv in the present because Liv doesn't know about her present. She has a memory gap of two years and three months. And anytime she goes to sleep, she forgets her immediate past. She wakes up and her last memory was two years and three months ago. She's in her office at work. She gets a call that's ultimately going to change her life. And that's her last memory. From Liv's perspective, you are not finding out anything about modern Liv and what her life is like and why she's got the memory problems and things like that. What you are getting though is her past. Like she's flashing back to the past her life, her boyfriend, her best friend, all of that stuff. So you are learning about her past leading up to that day that ended up changing her life two years and three months ago. But you are learning about present day Liv from Detective Halliday because she is investigating the crime that Liv is connected to. So you're finding out who the victim is, how they are connected to Liv, why Liv is having these memory problems and the trauma that kind of caused them. I found it all incredibly fascinating, very fast paced, bingeable to read. I was super engaged throughout the entirety of the thing and I just wanted to keep reading all of the time. So overall, this was was just so solid and well woven. I really had a great time with this one. So absolutely a four stars. And so since I'm still kind of on the high of stay awake and I wanted another similar read, I ended up going ahead and picking up Every Last Fear by Alex Finley. This was one of the challenges that I pulled for myself for the month of May. And so I needed to go ahead and get it read. And already I am really enjoying it. I was enjoying it so much. I actually passed the turn for my work and I don't remember the last time that that's happened. That's how involved I was with this book. So this book is is following our main character, Matt. He is a college student at NYU. He's only 21 years old. And at the start of the story, he gets devastating news. He gets the news that his father, mother, younger sister, and brother all inexplicably died on their vacation in Mexico. They think that it was kind of a sudden and severe gas leak in the place that they were staying, but that hasn't been completely confirmed. Obviously, this is crazy devastating to Matt, but he and his family are actually no strangers to trauma. His older brother, Danny, was tried and convicted of killing his girlfriend. And so he is currently in prison, but there has actually been a 
documentary released that kind of thinks Danny is innocent. And so he's getting worldwide publicity. It's kind of reminding me of Making a Murderer on Netflix. The twist here is that Matt actually thinks his brother did the crime. He thinks he witnessed something on the night that Danny's girlfriend died that makes him guilty. So you have Danny in prison and obviously that was a very big trauma for their family. And now Matt has basically lost everything else. And that's all that I've really gotten up to so far. We're getting introduced to Matt and his family and of course Danny. And now Matt is having to go to Mexico to kind of claim his family's bodies and take them back to the United States. And I'm pretty sure that there's going to be a lot more going on. I'm not really sure how it all intersects. I'm thinking that possibly Danny's crime had something to do with what happened to Matt's family. Like I said, I am really enjoying this so far. I am using Stay Awake to satisfy the faith prompt for Slayer Fest to read a dark or taboo book, or actually Every Last Fear could also satisfy that as well. Cause you know, there's murder, mystery, and all of that good stuff. For right now, y'all, I'm hungry. I'm going to go to lunch. I'll check in with you a little bit later. Hello friends, it is Wednesday afternoon. I had to think about that for a second because I keep thinking it's Thursday and you can imagine my disappointment when I realize that it's not. I am on my way to the gym, but I wanted to come on here and give you an update because I have since finished Every Last Fear by Alex Finley. For the most part, I really do think that this was a strong suspense thriller. Like I was definitely compelled from start to finish. I wanted to keep turning the pages, but I will say that I feel like the middle portion of the story definitely lost some of its momentum, primarily because I feel like Alex Finley was trying to do a lot with this story and he added a lot of complexity in here. And so I was kind of getting lost in the minutia of it. There were actually way more perspectives in here that I was thinking. So of course you're getting Matt, you're getting Matt's perspective because he's the one that's really just lost his entire family. And then he's basically told that there's likely foul play involved with this. You are also getting perspectives from Matt's father, mother, and sister in the days immediately leaving up to their trip to Mexico right before they died. So there are all of these like little smaller storylines going on. And of course, each different perspective has its own other characters that it's mentioning. And so you're kind of also having to think, are these characters important? Are they red herrings? So Alex Finley was definitely trying to do a lot with the story and it was more than I bargained for. I think it was more than I wanted to see because I think it kind of took away from the overall idea that Matt is a college student who has just lost his entire family. There is a huge tragedy involved in that, but I didn't feel the immensity of that tragedy because it was so overshadowed by everything else that was going on. And then you also have the perspective of the FBI agent that is trying to help Matt and is trying to uncover what is happening. And because of that, I don't necessarily think that any one perspective or any one side storyline was stronger than the other. And I think that some of it could have been taken away. Overall though, I still really had a great reading experience with this. I will absolutely be checking out more from Alex Finley in the future. And I have now decided to pick up The Martian by Andy Weir. This is going to satisfy a Slayer Fest prompt of Robo Buffy to read a science fiction. It's also going to satisfy a TBR game prompt. If you're not familiar, this is a story that follows our main character, Mark Watney. He was with a small team that had a mission to Mars and he has been left behind on Mars. Everybody thought that he died in this sandstorm that occurred that really made them abort their mission early. He kind of got like speared with something and so everybody thought that he was dead, but he's actually not, he's alive. And so his team has taken off without him and he is stranded on Mars. And a lot of this is told in diary format as he's like writing logs of his experiences trying to survive on Mars. And then you're also getting perspectives of people on Earth and what's going on once they kind of discover based on satellite images that he is actually alive. I think I might have listened to maybe an hour of it this morning, so two hours in total because I listened on two times speed. So still overall early days into the story. I'm not as sold on the story as a lot of other people who read it are just because Mark Watney's perspective is very, very scientific. He is a botanist and so you're going over all of the science that he is using to keep himself alive with regard to like oxygen and plant growing and cultivating the earth on Mars and all of the stuff that is happening very, very science heavy. So naturally it is going right over my head. I don't necessarily think you need to understand all the science in order to enjoy it because I think if that was the case, more people would not have enjoyed this nearly as much. I think one of the main things that people love about the story, and I can totally see it, is Mark Watney's humor. He has a lot of great humor, especially for the situation that he's in. And I think it's humor that a lot of us can relate to. I think it's humor that we would also default to if we were in such a shitty situation as that. So I'm not necessarily emotionally connected to the story yet because his perspective is so scientific and therefore it is also dry. And then the perspectives of the people back on earth, like the people at NASA that are realizing that he is still alive back on Mars, they're not distinguished. It's a third person perspective. So you're getting names thrown at you and everybody's having these conversations and things like that, but they're not really substantial perspectives. So I don't think you're really meant to emotionally connect to them. You're meant to emotionally connect to Mark 
but I'm not there yet. We're gonna see. I hope I start enjoying it a little bit more than I currently am, but that is the plan. The plan is to finish The Martian, and once I do, I will basically be almost done with the TBR that I set for myself for May, which is astonishing considering how many books I actually had formerly on my TBR, then not to mention all of the books that I'm just naturally reading as part of Slayer Fest. Anyway, y'all, that is the reading update. I have got to head to the gym or else I'm going to be late, but I will check in with you when I have a little bit more thoughts and feelings on The Martian. It is Friday, May 19th, and I'm coming on here with what is going to be the very final formal update for this vlog. Robert and I are heading out to the Brooks and Dunn concert later tonight, so I will probably try to get a few clips here and there of that, and those will be the very final B-roll clips of this vlog, but I'm desperately trying to get all of the clips edited and uploaded so that it could go up on Sunday as scheduled. I like doing two-week vlogs because it gives me a lot more opportunity to film content, but then when I have a lot of content, getting all of that together and edited is quite a pain in the butt, so that's what I'm working on. I apologize if the vlog goes up a little bit late on Sunday. I am working on it. I'm actually going to be gone most of the day tomorrow, which is Saturday as well, because first thing in the morning, I'm heading to my gym. We're doing a workout that's a once a year event. It's like a once a year event for all CrossFit gyms. It's called Murph. And it's definitely on the longer side in terms of a workout. And then I have to go get my nails done. I'm going to come home. I'm not going to be home for very long because then we have to go grocery shopping. So it's going to be a busy day, not necessarily an exciting day, but it's also a day that I'm not going to be able to edit all that often until later at night. Do you hear that? That is Nolan growling at Archie. I love filming out in this space, y'all, but there is just so much noise going on at all times. But anyway, I do have some reading updates for you. I have two of them, and one of them is very exciting. I actually finally finished The Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson today. I cannot believe it. I was not expecting to finish that until the end of June, and I got it done in two months. I gave it five stars, even though it was definitely a slow, tedious read. I was so immersed in it, and it was just like such an accomplishment to finish it. And by the end, I was fully invested, and now I can't wait to see what happens in the other books, which are actually even longer than The Way of Kings, which is crazy to me. He's got four books out now in this series, and two of them are over 1,200 pages. So this is a series that is fully an investment, and I really enjoyed myself. But anyway, the second reading update is that I finished The Martian by Andy Weir, and I'm going with a four stars for that one, but I had a little bit of difficulty deciding on my rating. This book, y'all, is very, very science and math heavy. Mark Watney, he is an astronaut. He's a very insanely clever guy. He's an engineer. He's a botanist. So all of the science and all of the math is in this book. And so he is going into great detail about all of the things that he is doing to try to stay alive on Mars. And most of this book is written in log format. Like he is logging what he is doing every single day. And there were really only two things that saved this book for me that really made it a worthwhile read. First is Mark Watney's sense of humor. I loved his sense of humor. He was always a very positive, sarcastic person throughout the entirety of this book. And I could get behind that because that's how I myself deal with like crisis or terrifying situations. You know, I make jokes. That's what I do. Even when it's completely inappropriate, I'm going to make a joke. I'm going to see the humor and the light in any situation. And that's what Mark Watney does. So I absolutely loved his sense of humor. And I listened to this via audio. I would never have been able to get through this book physically because of all the math, the physics, the chemistry, all of that stuff. I would never have been able to slog through this book. So the audiobook really helped. And I think Will Wheaton, who narrates it, did a fantastic job of bringing Mark Watney's voice to light. He didn't do such a great job with all of the other characters, like all of the little people that you're following at NASA who are trying to help rescue Mark Watney. But Will Wheaton did a fantastic job overall of bringing Mark Watney Watney's voice to life. His humor, he captured that really well. So I think he did a fantastic job overall of narrating this book and it really, really helped me get through it. By the end of the story, I found myself getting really emotional, especially as we were starting to get to like the rescue side of it. I found myself like choking up for like two seconds. I was like, oh, I guess I'm a little bit more connected to this than I thought. But overall, like without the humor, without the audiobook narration, I don't think I would have been connected to this at all. I think it would have been a very dry read, especially without the humor. But on the negative side, because of that humor, a lot of the things that Mark Watney was doing and saying it really didn't feel all that dire. Like, you know that Mark Watney is in, like, almost literally an impossible situation, right? Can you even imagine what it would be like to be stranded on Mars? And so he's in these very dire circumstances. But yeah, I didn't necessarily feel that direness because of just his sense of humor and how he was relaying all of the information. So there was a lack of suspense to me. I didn't feel like Mark Watney was in immediate danger, which of course he is because he's on Mars. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, all these little things could kill him on Mars. Overall, I'm giving it a four stars. I'm glad that I read it. I'm glad that I got to experience this book that so many people 
people love. Am I going to read more from Andy Weir? I don't know. You'll have to let me know if you've read Andy Weir and if you think his other books are worth the read. But anyway, y'all, I need to stop filming and get it edited and uploaded. So I'm going to stop chatting now, but I will catch you at the start of the next vlog. Thank you.